hour last night to see everyone. Um, wonderful thing. So quite a challenge for me this week. We went from the 10 chapters of, of Esther to now the 42 chapters of Job in one week. So we're going to see if we can make it all the way through. If you guys would go ahead and turn to chapter 2 of Job and we're going to look at verses 3 through 6. Chapter 2 and verses 3 through 6. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. This is going to be one of the key verses uh, for our study this morning that really summarizes what the conflict that happens in the book of Job. And it's very applicable to our lives as well. How often has something bad happened in your life that did not seem to have an explanation? Have you ever found yourself in the midst of a trial that didn't appear to have a purpose? You know, it's very easy to wind up with a bad attitude or to find ourselves resenting the circumstances of life when they don't make sense. And some of us really want stuff to make sense more than others. I would say I'm one of those people. Unfortunately, frustration over life's up and downs isn't really in the end frustration at God because he is, after all, the one who allows us to go through times of testing. One of the main themes of the book of Job, highlighted in the verses we just read, teaches believers more about their human perspective on difficulties and hardships. All of us, like Job, have at best an extremely limited view of the world. We are not capable of seeing or understanding even a tiny sliver of what God is able to, and yet many times... We approach the trials of life as though we know just about everything. In Job's experience, we are reminded once again of our finite and earthly perspective on God's infinite purposes. Psalm 131 and verse 1 says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty, neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. The truth is, without the revelation of God, none of us would ever know the reasons behind Job's suffering. We're aware of the discussion between the Lord and Satan only because God chose to tell us about it. All believers are dependent upon God for this type of understanding. So a study on the book of Job should cause us to better appreciate our total reliance on God's knowledge. Job was a believer, But unlike us, he didn't have the benefit of reading about what happened in God's throne room, and he could not see with his eyes exactly what Satan was doing. He just saw the results. Each one of us has the same responsibility that Job bore, choosing to honor God and trust in his wisdom even when the circumstances don't make sense to us. When we don't understand the trials or difficulties, we must not begin to resent God. Instead, We need to remember just how tiny our view of the world really is. We can't see the whole picture because of our own limitations, not because the Lord is distant or unjust. Rather than resentment, believers should be thankful for what they do know, for what God has revealed to them. If it wasn't for his mercy in giving us his word, we wouldn't know the most important truth of all. We wouldn't know about his son. Now, in introduction to this morning's study, On the book of Job, I want to remind you that we've transitioned to a new set of Old Testament books. This is Lesson 19. At this point, we've finished the Pentateuch, God's Law, and we've studied the entire history of Israel prior to the coming of Christ. And now as we move forward, I want to welcome you to an exciting section of the Old Testament commonly referred to as the books of poetry and wisdom. Now, thankfully, the Bible is not just a list of dry religious doctrines. This is the inspired word of God. It was written as holy men were moved by the Holy Spirit. As a result, it comes to us connected with the lives and experiences of the people of God. Scripture expresses all the emotions of the life of faith, and it deals with many areas of experience that might even seem to be mundane. There is, this is no more, nowhere more true than in its poetic and wisdom literature. 
The Psalms, for example, illustrate every emotion a believer will encounter in life, be it praise and love for God, anger at those who practice violence and deceit, personal grief and confusion, or appreciation for God's truth. The book of Proverbs not only examines serious moral issues, it also helps us deal with the ordinary matters of life, such as relationships and work habits. Song of Songs celebrates the joy of love between a man and a woman. Job and Ecclesiastes forces believers to face life's most profound questions and brings us to a more genuine faith in God. In sum, none of these books are impractical or theoretical. They deal with life in a very realistic and honest way. We ought also to understand that the term poetic refers to their form, how they're written. It must not be thought to imply that they're simply the product of human imagination. Traditionally, Psalms and Song of Songs are set apart as the books of biblical poetry, and Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes are characterized as the wisdom writings. Though these books will be the focus of these studies, other Old Testament books also share many similar features. These five so-called books of poetry are not the only poetry in the Old Testament scriptures. Lamentations is essentially a collection of psalms and of lament. Psalms are actually found scattered throughout the prophets, like Jonah chapter 2 or Habakkuk chapter 3. The books of Ruth, Esther, and Daniel actually have a lot in common with the wisdom literature. Even the New Testament contains a few psalms and proverbs in Luke, Acts, and 1 Corinthians. So before beginning a study through the books of poetry, we should note that they all share certain characteristics. The books of poetry are largely written from an experiential perspective. They concern themselves with individuals, and they address issues having to do with the human heart. The books portray real human experience. They grapple with profound problems, and they express critical realities. They especially concern themselves with the experiences of the godly, in the highs and lows of this life, which is often filled with change. This particular book takes its name from the chief character, a man named Job. This man experienced extreme suffering at the loss of his wealth, family, and then health, and he struggled with the question of why these things had happened to him. The fact that Job was a real historical person is settled by the scripture itself. James 5.11 says, Ye have heard of the patience of Job, through the prophet Ezekiel, God said of the land, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. Now the author of this book is unknown. There are no claims in it as to the author's identity. People have suggested Job himself, or perhaps Elihu, Moses, or Solomon. We don't know 100% who it was. Many believe that Job lived prior to the time of Abraham and that he is one of the links between Noah and Abraham. It's likely that the events recorded in Job took place during the second millennium BC, and there are several facts that seem to support this early dating. Job is likely the oldest, Bible, oldest book in the entire Bible. Job lived for more than 140 years. This was not an uncommon lifespan during the patriarchal period before Abraham. The economy of Job's day Wealth was measured in livestock. This was the type of measurement that existed during that time as well. Like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Job was the priest of his family. Job also makes no mention of the law, of any of the old patriarchs, or of the tabernacle. The absence of any reference to the nation Israel or the Mosaic law suggests a pre-Mosaic date, perhaps before 1500 BC. It's an old book. In whatever aspect we look at it, the book of Job is one of the most wonderful works of poetry that's ever been written. Tennyson called it the greatest poem, whether of ancient or modern literature. Job also has many interesting features that are not found in other Old Testament books. One of these is the fact that the book makes many references to the natural world. Though the Word of God is not a book written specifically to teach science, whenever it speaks of scientific matters, it's always precise and accurate. Consider the fact that this book was written more than 3,000 years ago, which is quite a long time before the invention of the modern scientific technology. Yet no other book in the Bible contains as much scientific data as Job. Let me give you a couple examples. Chapter 26 and verse 7 says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. What could more accurately describe the position and stability of our planet in space? 
There's a quote from a man named Paul Van Gorder about this. He says, Job's contemporaries all believed that the earth was flat and that it rested on the shoulders of one of the gods or on the back of an elephant or a giant sea turtle. Think of it, startlingly accurate scientific statements written more than 3,000 years before the discovery of America. In Job 38, 7, it says, When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Until modern times, not one of the world scientists could ever have dreamed that rays of light actually give off sounds that no human ear can hear. But Job declared it, and it was written down in the book of the God to whom the morning stars sing their praise. In chapter 38 and verse 24, it says, By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Reading those words, you would think Job had a distinct knowledge about prisms and spectrum analysis. In chapter 38 and verse 31, it says, Canst thou bind the sweet influence of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Pleiades is a group of seven stars in the constellation of Taurus. I'll probably butcher the pronunciation, but it's Alcyone. The brightest of these seven stars is actually, so far it is known, is the pivot around which our entire solar system revolves. How mighty and at once how sweet must be its influence to hold all of these worlds in place at a distance and to swing them around so smoothly. But I wonder how Job knew that. Remember, he did not have a telescope. The main character of our study is introduced right from the very first verse, which says there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Knowing about Job's character is important because it informs the rest of the narrative and it sets apart the context over what happens next. In this verse, we learn four things about Job. He was perfect, which means complete, all around mature. He was upright, coming from a Hebrew word meaning straight. He feared God. Remember, this is the beginning of wisdom. And he eschewed evil. And this refers to Job's moral conduct. Job was right with God, and he was right with man. In one, chapter 1 and verse 8, God said, There is none like him in the earth. What an honor God gave to Job to describe him using words like these. But despite Job's good character and conduct, he was forced to endure many terrible trials. The book of Job tells of a righteous man whom God, at Satan's insistence, permitted to be afflicted as a test of his faith and integrity. Other characters in this book are Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and Elihu. Three of Job's friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, came to comfort him. In their feeble attempts to deal with the situation, all three offered essentially the same philosophy. All suffering is due to sin. They tried without success to persuade Job to repent of some hidden sin. The fourth, Elihu, however, declared that suffering can be a means of purifying the righteous. The book of Job vindicates the goodness, justice, and sovereign character of God despite the existence of suffering and evil in the world. You probably have heard many unbelievers use this question, but Job deals specifically with the idea, if God is a God of love and mercy, why is there suffering and why do the righteous suffer? It teaches us about the unbreakable rule and reign of God and the need for man to acknowledge this rule. One of God's purposes is to strip away all of our self-righteousness so we come to a place of complete trust. The answer to the question of suffering given in this book comes across to us in three ways. Number one, God is worthy of love even apart from the blessings that he gives to us. Number two, God may permit suffering as a means of purifying and strengthening the believer in godliness. And number three, God's thoughts and ways are far too vast for the small minds of men to comprehend. We've touched on that already. Even though man is able to correctly, is unable to correctly perceive the issues of life with the breadth and vision of the Almighty, God knows what is best for his own glory and for our ultimate good. In chapter 2, we see the beginning of this book's conflict when God asks Satan, From whence comest thou? What a tragedy lies in the answer. Satan replied, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. The devil's statement reveals the endless, tireless restlessness of evil. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The desperate struggle between Job and his adversary is allowed to take place in the open, so we might learn the secret of spiritual warfare. Job's adversary was a person, not a mere influence. 
Satan is referred to at least 18 times in three verses, and personal pronouns are used which unmistakably reveal his personality. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. And in this book, we get a look at Satan doing his best to crush and overthrow and bring down this perfect man. The devil always strives to set God and believers against one another. Both the extent and the limit of Satan's powers are brought out in this narrative. He had power to bring up the hordes of hostile Sabians and Chaldeans to carry off the oxen and the asses and the camels. He had the ability to manipulate the lightning to consume the sheep, to summon the wind, to slay Job's children, and to smite Job himself with a terrible disease. For good reason, the Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. But on the other hand, Satan had no power at all, except insofar as God permits him to break through the protection surrounding his servants. Salvation did not spare Job from satanic assault, and Job can only put up a weak resistance by himself. Job's experience is very similar to Simon Peter, who is also not delivered from spiritual attack, even though he was right in the presence of Christ. Job was a very wealthy man, but riches are not what a man needs if he's going to stand firm against all the wiles of the devil. He needs the Lord. He needs to follow the direction of Scripture, which says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What is the answer to Satan's challenge? Did Job fear God for nothing? The answer, remarkably, is no. Job did not serve God for nothing. Job learned that the real benefit of his piety was not his health and his wealth and his children and his physical blessings. It was God himself. God, the creator and the judge of all, will bring about the triumph of righteousness in the believer's life. And Job now knew he could trust God to do all things right, even if it cost Job everything he had, for he still had God. What comfort there is here for a child of God. No trouble can touch him except what the Lord allows. He who has shut up the sea with doors and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed, will never suffer believers to be tempted above what they are able or allow the furnace to be hotter than we can bear. It's easy to forget this principle and extend to become confused about the problem of suffering. Remember, the disciples of Christ also thought that trials were always the result of sin. Job's miserable comforters also erred in thinking that all suffering is God's special judgment upon some special sin. Whoever perished being innocent was the question that they asked him. They reasoned that Job's sin against God must be exceptionally great to account for such terrible suffering. It's important to remember Job's attitude towards God. He was one who had access to him through the blood of sacrifice and who was walking with God in integrity of heart and conformity of life. Job knew that his heart was true to God, and so he could not accept the accusations of his friends. He shows them that their conclusion was false and that the wicked often prosper in the world by saying they gather the vintage of the wicked in chapter 24. Elihu, who had been listening to the argument between Job and his friends, summarizes their entire discussion with two sentences. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he testified, justified himself rather than God. Then he denounced Job's three friends because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Elihu's discussion brought out God's gracious purpose in the chastisement of his children. Elihu's words prepare the way for God's own revelation of himself, which would come next. Even after everything that had happened, it was the vision of God himself that completed the work and brought Job down into the dust. Before, he had protested and stated he was prepared to reason with God over his seemingly strange dealings with him. But when God took him at his word and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? Job re replied, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. May we all say that more often. God continued to deal with him patiently until Job was brought to the very end of himself and finally cried out, I have uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes." Wonderfully applicable to evangelism, isn't it? After being humble, Job's faith began to grow even through his affliction. This change culminated in the glorious words, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter day, at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. 
whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. What a vision of the future life we're presented with. What a prophecy of the coming Savior sounded forth from the earliest ages of man. Job sees the Lord Jesus Christ the same way that the book of Ruth does, as the goal, the kinsman redeemer, not as some distant stranger. Job sees Christ as the one who, because he is our next of kin, has the right to redeem any man willing to place their trust in him. In the book of Job, we read about more than just a theory of suffering. Instead, we see a living example of one of God's children placed right in the middle of unspeakable pain. We see the real effects of it upon his life. God assigned Job to a special ministry of suffering because he loved him. He allowed him to experience great trials. Even in the midst of his torment, Job recognized that only gold is worth putting through the fire. All of us in our prosperity are constantly in danger of becoming self-confident and of trading our position or cares in this life for our trust in God. As God dealt with Job, we see him broken, melted, and softened, so he could say with all honesty, The hand of God hath touched me, and God maketh my heart soft. The book of Job gives believers God-honoring reasons for suffering. In spite of everything that had happened, Job was really being honored and greatly used by God. How wonderful it would be if you and I learned how to thank God for everything that happens to us. Just like Job, God has wise purposes for all of our suffering. God wants to show us his manifold wisdom. He wants the trials of our faith to produce godly patience. He wants to bring out the gold and reveal true spiritual character. Like Job, we will never really see ourselves until we see God as he is revealed in his word. As a young man, the prophet Isaiah proclaimed, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now, as we continue, I want to direct your attention to some key chapters and verses for your additional study. Some key chapters. Chapters 1 and 2 are going to be crucial because they introduce the reader to the source of Job's suffering. We know this is Satan's accusations, and then the affliction falls upon him. The next key chapters are 38 through 42. Here we find God's speech and the silencing of Job, followed by Job's repentance and restoration in chapter 42. So chapters 1 and 2, and then at the end, chapters 38 and 42. In between that, we'll talk about that, but it's a series of different uh, speeches. For some key verses, I'm going to start in chapter 33 and verse 10. 33 and verse 10. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. And then chapter 13 and verse 15. 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. 42.10. The last one is chapter 42 and verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So we have 33.10, 13.15, and 42.10. The key words in the book of Job are affliction, misery, and hardship. We see those nine times. And the words righteous or righteousness appear 20 times throughout the book. The key idea or theme over this entire book is perseverance. Even Job's wife told him to curse God and die in chapter 2 and verse 9. Job was severely tempted to abandon his faith in a loving God based on his circumstances. Besides the financial turmoil of the loss of his fortune and the emotional pain of losing his children, he was afflicted by terrible sickness in his own body. Yet he endured the great suffering because Job refused to abandon God, God did not abandon him. This book is one of those things that Paul likely had in mind when he penned Romans 15.4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. All right, how is Christ seen in Job? Well, all over the place. We don't have time to go through everything. Again and again, we have the foreshadowing of the Savior. We see him in the accepted sacrifices which Job offered for his children as the book opens and for his friends as it closes. We see him in Job's question, how should man be just with God? A question answered only in him who has justified us by his blood. Job acknowledges a redeemer and he prays for a mediator. 
He knows he needs someone who can explain the mystery of suffering, which is only answered in Christ. The Lord identifies with our suffering and ultimately answers Satan's accusations and defeats him. We see him in the day's man, whom Job longs for between him and God. He says, For he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. That's a picture of the mediating need of Christ. The need of a human heart has only been met in God, our Savior. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. We see Christ again in the words of Elihu. Then he is gracious unto him, and saith, Deliver him from going down to the pit, I have found a ransom. The ransom prophesied by Elihu and the ransom proclaimed by Paul are one and the same. The next verse gives us the result of this ransom. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. Cleansing and communion rest only on the ground of Christ's atonement. Job himself, as a person, is a very instructive type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple things. Job was the greatest man in all the East. Christ, whose goings forth have been from everlasting, is the greatest of all. In all things, he has the preeminence. Job was perfect and upright, fearing God and eschewing evil. Our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus, was the perfect God-man, holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Job was suddenly brought from great riches to great poverty. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. Job was assaulted by Satan. But what were the sufferings of Job compared to the sufferings of our Lord Jesus for the salvation of our souls? Satan was the instrument that brought sorrow to Job, but all his adversities came by the will and hand of God, and he knew it. So it was with our dear Savior. Job made an effectual sacrifice and effectual intercession for his friends by the will of God. How our hearts should rejoice to know that our Lord Jesus Christ made an effectual sacrifice for us and effectually intercedes for us. Because God accepted Job, he accepted those for whom Job made intercession. Because our great God accepts his son, he accepts us in him. Job was laid low that he might be exalted very high. Our Lord Jesus was made least in the kingdom of heaven that he might be the greatest. All right, turn to chapter 4, and let's look at verses 1 through 6. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I titled the, uh, the lesson portion of this today, The Danger of Carnal Counsel. So we're going to talk about godly counsel and the opposite of that. In Job 4, 6, we see the beginning of one of the speeches that Job's friends and visitors made to him. It says, Then Elphaz the Temanite answered and said, If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholden him that was fallen, that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it is come upon thee, and thou faintest. It toucheth thee, and thou art troubled. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and the uprightness of thy ways? By the time we come to chapter 4 of this book, Job's life has spiraled completely out of control, and he's reduced to a shell of the man that he once was. God had permitted the devil to exercise a great deal of his evil influence, and as a result, Job is left with absolutely nothing. The tale of Job's swift downfall apparently spread far and wide because three of Job's friends heard the unfortunate news, and they all traveled from his own place, their own place, to meet with him. They found Job sitting outside the city in the ashes of a garbage dump, and he was covered with boils from head to toe. As the three men got closer, they saw that Job was using a broken piece of pottery to scrape his painful sores, and he'd lost so much weight that he was nearly unrecognizable. Job's existence was one of extreme pain and grief. In respect for his plight, the three visitors didn't make a single sound for seven days and nights. Finally, Job broke the silence with the grief-stricken lament that we find in chapter 3. Job's entire declaration can be summed up with the words, I just want to die. It is clear that Job was not in good shape, physically, mentally, or spiritually. The six verses we just read in chapter 4 
appear near the beginning of several back and forth dialogues shared between the book's main character and his three visitors, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Eliphaz introduces his first speech by asking about Job's attitude. He wants to know if his friend is going to be offended when the men start speaking. Next, Eliphaz describes Job's track record of personal counsel and advice. Prior to the disasters that befell him, Job had, Job had evidently engaged in quite a bit of instruction and encouragement. Eliphaz says that Job had taught, which means dis disciplined or corrected, many, that he had strengthened the weak and that he had supported those who were falling, which means tottering or wavering. Now some terrible trials have come into Job's life, and Eliphaz observes that he is troubled and has grown faint because of them. Eliphaz challenges Job with two introductory questions. Is not this thy fear, which means reverence for God, thy confidence? Or isn't your fear of God your confidence? Isn't there hope in a righteous life? Eliphaz's conversations with Job give us some great examples of what we're going to address today in this study. It's on something I want to call carnal counseling. This would be any advice, instruction, or encouragement that violates the principles of God's word. There are some very damaging ideas about wisdom present in this world, and we need to be able to recognize and steer clear of them. But please don't think that this message is against giving advice. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that there is great value in both the giving and receiving of wise counsel. Proverbs 11.14 teaches, Where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Proverbs 4.13 admonishes all believers, Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Throughout our lives, we're given numerous chances to share wisdom with other people, and no doubt, each of us has been blessed by a friend's counsel and insight. In fact, in a recent study on the epistle of Titus, we learned that those that are older in the Lord are actually expected to train and mentor younger believers. Every member of a church fits into this scriptural model. No one is exempt from either giving or receiving counsel in one of the Lord's churches. There are no sideline Christians present in the Bible. Our shared spiritual responsibility is exciting, and it can also be a bit intimidating. It's a big deal. We all need to recognize just how much influence we can have over others. One of the really neat things about the book of Job is that it gives us many excellent examples of counseling. Now, unfortunately, much of the advice that was given to Job was either unhelpful or even worse, it was just plain wrong. This entire book teaches us about the need for godly counsel, and to make its point, the book of Job is structured around three different cycles of debate and response. The order goes Job, then Eliphaz, back to Job, then Bildad, back to Job, then Zophar, and then back to Job again. This pattern repeats two more times throughout chapters 22 through 31. So as you're reading through that, just keep that in mind. We're seeing a dialogue jumping back and forth between people. What I want for us to pay attention to are some key characteristics we can see in the different speeches. What can they teach us about the importance and responsibility of godly counsel? Well, number one, godly counsel does not overemphasize personal experience. Godly counsel does not overemphasize personal experience. As we examine the statements made by Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, it seems reasonable to conclude that Eliphaz was the oldest because he is the first to speak. Later on in chapter 15 and verse 10, he says, With us are both the gray-headed and very aged men, much elder than thy father. Chapter 32 and verse 4 tells us that the fourth speaker, Elihu, actually waited until the rest of the men had finished because they were all older than him. Some great applications here for young men, by the way. Maybe we should wait to speak. Given his status, it is interesting to see where much of Eliphaz's advice appears to come from. Look at verse 8 of chapter 4. Even, if I, even as I have seen... They that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Now turn to chapter 5 and look at verse 3. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. Jump down to verse 27. This is the end of his speech, and he says, Lo this, we have searched it, so it is, hear it, and know thou it for thy good. And then lastly, look back at chapter 4 and verses 12 through 21. 12 through 21. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, 
which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes, there was silence, and I heard a voice saying, and I'm going to leave it at saying, what do each of these statements have in common? Eliphaz had evidently seen and heard a great deal during the span of his long life. In chapters 4 and 5, Eliphaz introduces what he wants to say both times with the words, I have seen. He closes out his first speech with a guarantee, we have searched it, so it is, and know thou it for thy good. The word search means to explore or examine. Eliphaz based much of his advice on two things, his own personal experiences in life and what appears to be a very memorable nightmare or vision. Now, there's nothing wrong with using our life experiences, whether good or bad, as a teaching opportunity. There's also nothing unbiblical about sharing our observations with people. Peter and John defied the religious leaders in Jerusalem with the words, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. The problem comes when people's personal observations and experiences begin to redefine biblical truth. In verse 7 of chapter 4, Eliphaz hangs his hat on these words, Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or were the, where were the righteous cut off? Next, he will go on to describe his personal observations of those that practice evil. Ultimately, the conclusion that Eliphaz comes to is that his friend must have committed some great wickedness to deserve what has happened. Eliphaz builds his case in, verses, in chapter 4, verses 9 through 11, but every example he uses comes back to his original point. Basically, the righteous don't perish and the innocent are not cut off. Eliphaz may be staying true to his own personal experience, but the problem is that what he's telling Job is not correct. Solomon said, All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. The prophet Jeremiah asked the Lord, Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy which deal very treacherously? Hebrews 11 tells us that countless righteous were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And many innocent had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. The righteous were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, and they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Godly counsel does not overemphasize personal experience, because our experiences and perceptions, while sometimes valuable, can frequently teach us things that are totally contrary to the Bible. Let me give you three examples. Child discipline. How many times have you been tempted to resort to other methods when spanking just does not appear to be working? Aren't there better and more effective ways to get the same results? Biblical separation. Wouldn't everything be so much easier if we didn't have to separate from stuff? Doesn't it seem like our ministry might grow faster if we relaxed the standards just a little? Or evangelism. Couldn't we generate a better response from people if we just adjusted the message a tiny little bit? If we softened our approach a little here and there? If we used something besides the Bible to give us a chance to share the Bible? The truth is, people have made all kinds of very reasonable sounding arguments proving we don't need to spank our kids, we shouldn't separate from sin and error, and that preaching the gospel plainly will not attract the lost. There are entire bookstores filled with their inspiring personal experiences, insights, and advice. So what's the problem? The issue is that just like Eliphaz, these folks, however sincere, have departed from the faith once delivered to the saints. They have permitted their experiences to subvert biblical doctrine. Our personal experiences, however inspiring, must be interpreted, interpreted through scriptural principle, never the other way around. Godly counsel does not overemphasize personal experience. Number two, godly counsel does not run on assumptions. Godly counsel does not run on assumptions. The next visitor to speak is Bildad the Shuhite who's also the shortest guy in the Bible, by the way. He starts off his response to Job by basically telling him that he's talking way too much. Verse 2 of chapter 8 says, How long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? No doubt some of you are asking that question right now. How would you like... Hold on, I zoomed in. How would you like to have your tale of woe described as a strong wind? 
Regardless, the main issue facing Bildad is not so much his lack of tact, but his tendency to jump to conclusions. Remember, while every part of the Bible is true and faithful because it is God's word, there are some scriptures that God has preserved specifically to teach us about the vanity of human opinion. The speeches of Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar can give us three helpful examples of carnal counsel. Unfortunately, Bildad the Shuhite will arrive at much the same position taken by Eliphaz, except he takes it even further and ends up accusing Job of being a hypocrite. An examination of chapter 8 shows that Bildad, Bildad believed that God was hiding himself because of Job's sin and hypocrisy. In verses 6 through 7, he says, If thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. Job's perspective is, Bildad's perspective is that Job should just repent for his wrongdoing. If Job repents, according to Bildad, all the material things he had lost will be restored. He's saying, in effect, Job, you wouldn't be in this mess if you just got your act together and stopped pretending to be righteous. If you only had more faith in God, God would be sure to help you. The implication of Bildad's speech is that Job is not pure and upright and that material prosperity is linked with one's righteous behavior. Job responds, wishing he could plead his case before God and lamenting the fact there is no one to intervene for him. Bildad's second speech in Job 18 focuses on the theme that God always punishes the wicked. His logic is that since Job is being punished so severely, he must have done something very terrible. In Job 19, Job responds with a plea to just be left alone. He says, how long will you vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? He also asks for his friend's pity and declares that his God is alive and knows all things. God will be the one to judge him fairly, and Job puts his trust in him. Bildad's third speech in Job 25 focuses on the idea that a person cannot be righteous before God. In the center of this short chapter, it says, How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Job answers, arguing that only God can know all things and fully understand his situation. The speeches made by Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar all teach us about the great danger of making assumptions and jumping to conclusions. If we neglect to understand what's really going on in a given situation, we will cause more harm than good. Proverbs 18.13 says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Some of the advice that Bildad gave to Job was correct. The problem was that because of Bildad's assumptions, his counsel was not applicable. It was unhelpful because Bildad was giving the solution to a problem that didn't really exist. And this is very applicable to us because it's a very good thing to desire to help someone and to want to give them answers, good answers, to life's tough problems. But if we don't take the time to listen and understand the whole matter, and instead we rush to share our opinion, we will end up failing to help them. Proverbs 17.27 tells us, He that hath knowledge spareth his words. And 10.19 says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Since our counsel has to be based upon the principles of God's word, we had better make sure we know exactly what is going on before we try to apply the Bible to another believer's situation. I'm not saying that you have to know every intricate detail before giving people advice, but making sweeping assumptions and ignorant judgments is never going to result in edification. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar all made assumptions about why Job was suffering. They wanted an easy, cookie-cutter solution for a very difficult problem. Rather than drawing the wrong conclusions, let's consider just six reasons why the righteous might suffer. These are all backed up by Scripture. Number one, as the result of the fall of man. Number two, as the result of personal sin. Number three, as the result of somebody else's sin. Number four, as a form of discipline. Number five, as an example or inspiration to others. Or number six, for reasons known only to the mind of God. In John 9, our Lord's disciples asked him, Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus replied, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. There's just six reasons why should we jump to conclusions. Godly counsel does not run on assumptions. And then lastly, number three, Godly counsel is never abusive. This final point should come as no surprise. Godly counsel is never hurtful or abusive. 
Unfortunately, every one of us has probably experienced a time when someone claiming to represent the truth has engaged in some form of unrighteous or carnal behavior. People that try to give others accountability or counsel from a position of pride frequently end up leaving a path of spiritual destruction in their wake. We see this kind of attitude pictured best in Job's third visitor. After Eliphaz and Bildad, Zophar spoke and he offered his advice to Job. Zophar's speech begins in chapter 11 and his statements are easily the harshest of all. Zophar actually declared that Job, who had lost everything but his life at this point, deserved worse than what he got. In verse 6, he states, Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Job responds, It was the Lord that had brought this suffering upon him, and in chapter 13, maintains his innocence, stating, I know that I shall be justified. Zophar's second speech focuses on the fact that the person who commits wickedness will always suffer for it. His perspective is very similar to his peers. In his words, the increase of his house shall depart, and his good shall flow away in the day of his wrath. This is the portion of a wicked man from God, and the heritage appointed unto him by God. In Zophar's mind, this is the ultimate answer to Job's calamity, and he brings his opinion against Job with cruel force. In Job 21, Job answers that God does sometimes allow the wicked to prosper. He says they spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Like the other men, Zophar's reassessment of Job's condition was not accurate because Job had done nothing wrong and was still suffering, while the others who did evil lived safe from fear. Proverbs 25.12 says, As an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. As we go about to give counsel and advice, we had better not use the weapons of the flesh to deal with spiritual problems. Zophar shows us what happens when a person bases their opinion on personal experience and assumption and then uses that opinion to abuse somebody else. This is the worst example of carnal counseling in the book, and it's something we must avoid like the plague. A wise reprover will never operate like this. There will be no insults, put-downs, or name-calling present in their counsel. They will not manipulate, condescend, make ultimatums, or bully the people they are working with. These are all fruits of the flesh, not the spirit, and they can permanently damage the individual being counseled. This is not to say that accountability and advice will never require powerful rebuke, but the difference will be apparent in both the content of the reproof and the motive of the person offering it. One of the real tragedies present in the book of Job is the example of wasted opportunities. All three of Job's friends had a chance to give him needed support and excellent spiritual counsel. Unfortunately, they squandered their influence, preferring rather to rely on their personal experiences, assumptions, and pride. In the end, they failed to help their friend, and they were sternly rebuked by the Lord. Chapter 42 and verse 7 says, And it was so, that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, Here's the key phrase, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. So may each one of us never be found failing to speak the right thing about God, placing too much emphasis on our personal experiences, making assumptions, or giving people any kind of carnal counsel. May we be wise reprovers. Let's pray.